Well, good morning. Uh, our Mike L. Fisher here, uh, founder and director of the Ferology Institute, uh, founder and director of the In Search of Fearlessness Research Institute and the original uh, In Search of Fearlessness project in 1989. Just giving you a little overview of my history. It's been a long time, over 30 years, with this topic of fear. In today's video, I'm interested to share some of my best discoveries, perhaps, um, some yet to be proven to be best, but I think uh, are the most significant of my findings over these years. So I'm going to give you uh, uh, at least a list of some of those, and then I'm going to focus particularly on one particular uh, finding, which is my four meta motivation theory um, that involves locating fear. All of these um, findings uh, are locating fear within a more complex structure uh, rather than just being interested in fears as is the common uh, interest apparently in discourse of the popular and most research traditions. So fearology, which is again something that I've um, been a main leader in, uh, is uh, interested in a much more complex view of fear and its set of relationships. That's the real key thing in understanding fearology and fear. So um, I'm gonna use the whiteboard here um, to get started. Let's see. Find my drawing tool, text tool. Okay, here we go. So, review of Fisher's findings on fear over the last three decades. Let's start with uh, saying something of just first of all, in general, theoretical versus practical research and applications in fear studies. Uh, I've been often accused, and probably rightfully so, um, but I think uh, sometimes exaggeratedly so, of being too theoretical. <laughs> yeah, well, I am pretty theoretical, philosophical. However, uh, I will say I'm only in the sense doing that work because I really am interested in practical applications. Yeah, so I think uh, like we have fields of theoretical mathematics and applied mathematics, we have theoretical physics and applied physics. And those are just distinctions that evolved over time in, in the pursuit of knowledge and truth. And the good life is that sometimes we need to be theoretical, sometimes we need to be practical. Uh, when you put the theoretical and the practical together, uh, rather than at odds, so if I was to say not versus, but to say that if you add theoretical and philosophical, you're going to get something more complementary. Uh, complementary. And that's really called praxis. Theory plus practice, how they each feed each other and create better knowledge for all of us. Um, so that was one of the first points I wanted to make. The other one is, um, is that I use complex systems, evolutionary thinking, uh, models, and theories, constantly in all my work on fear, trying to understand fear. Okay, so um, that immediately gets us away from um, focusing on the simplicity of fears. Um, not my thing so much, but fear uh, itself and its patterning. It's patterning in how it lays out in genetics, everything from genetics to behavior to worldview systems. Um, I'm definitely interested in patterning, which I sometimes call um, fear patterning, fear patterns, fear patterning, or fear pattern virus plus operations 
and that's pure pattern virus plus that's kind of playing on the HIV positive operations and that's of course looking at more of the destructive side of fear. Okay, that's a lot of my emphasis is in that kind of analysis. Um, so you won't find me as I'm, you know, um, positive year attitudes discourses. I can understand those are have a place. And yes, fear has been often looked at too negatively, and because of that, we don't often go deeply into understanding it because we're moving away from fear. But I'm just trying to make fear positive again. Um, not my thing so much. All right. So those are a few intros. Let me get down to uh, one more last piece of intro here. You need to know before I go into my discoveries um, on fear that hierarchies of fears you know, has been looked at by uh, several different kinds of people, researchers from different fields, where they try to organize fear in, you know, these are more primal fears. So they'll often go, you know, from the most primal, instinctual uh, fear, like fear of depth, you know, when we're born with uh, fear of um, loud sounds. And then they'll hierarch make a hierarchy of fears uh, tomorrow, complex and ones that are more cognitive and you know they'll make their maps of, of these hierarchies of fears well today uh, I'm interested in you know my topic is going to be the topic that I'll spend the most time on is meta motivation theory of fear and that's a uh, uh, going to be an intervention that I think could be really useful in the future, um, which really shows the relationship between fear, love, freedom, and fearlessness. But I'll get to that. Um, just giving you a little heads up of that's what I'll be talking about. And meta motivations, uh, often any motivation theory, you know, you often think of Maslow when you think of motivation of needs and this hierarchy of needs, right? So there's hierarchy of needs, there's hierarchies of of fears that different people have put together. And these are psychological models, uh, as far as I can see. I've never seen one that isn't just in the field of psychology. So again, I'm not that interested in those um, models of hierarchies of fear that stick within the psychology discipline. So maybe I should just put that over here, uh, tend to be psychological um, dominated, all of those. Uh, hierarchies. Uh, motivation theories generally always are within that motivational um, psychological paradigm. So my interest is to develop this meta motivation theory of fear, which I'll talk about today, within a transdisciplinary perspective. And remember, example, fearology itself, as I've defined in many of my videos and writing, is a transdisciplinary study of the interrelationship of fear and life. All right, let's, let's clear that. My main discoveries, theories on fear. Since 1989. Why 1989 as a starting point is a whole long story, and that was the discovery of um, the In Search of Fearlessness project, um, which I won't go into here. I have talked about it a little bit in various places in my writing and perhaps even some of my videos. I can't remember exactly right now. There's so many of them. But uh, I would say the first discovery was that uh, fear is a project. I actually called it fear project with those marks, small marks on it. Right? Um, something I've talked about in, in a lot of my work and other videos 
because this represents the culturally modified version here. Kind of like uh, the analogy would be analogous with GMO, genetically modified organisms. Uh, I think there's a culturally modified um, fear that is much more complex than fears as we talk about it within psychology. So you can see culture, right? Um, we need to look at culture studies. We need to look at politics, history, uh, many, many uh, disciplines. That's why transdisciplinary study. So that was one of my first discoveries. Fear is a project, a fear project. And uh, again, I'm not going to go into a lot of the, these that I'm going to list other than that last one, which is meta motivations. Um, but the idea is that there seems to be this huge project on the planet that's going on. I don't know who started it, where it started. You could come up with all kinds of metaphysical and real analyses in the visible world to say, well, this is where fear started. This is why it keeps going. This is why it's so powerful. It's like a project. And there seems to be a tendency to want to keep humans in fear within this project, in excess fear, uh, in fear patterning, in culturally modified fear with the two marks. So I won't go into that anymore. The second one, I think uh, one of my big discoveries was the uh, spectrum of the fear concept. Um, that's based on a, a model of consciousness. Expand this box here. Of consciousness evolution over time, obviously through evolution, uh, and multiple consciousnesses from simple systems to complex systems. And my argument is fear continually is shifting and developing into a simple concept and phenomenon to very complex uh, systems and phenomenon, and the fear management that goes with that. Remember, um, that's essential in all my work, uh, the focus, is on fear management system. Because I, my real discovery, I guess, in doing the research in the original early, late 80s, sorry, early 90s, was that people are really only interested in fear if they, because they really want to know how to manage it better. And of course, for some, manipulate it better. All right, uh, another major discovery was the DCFB theory, which I just covered in one of my recent videos, a couple of recent videos actually, and I'm not gonna go into that other than it's, it makes claims that domination, conflict, fear, and violence are connected in a cyclical system. And if we're gonna understand fear and talk about fear, even fears, um, it's to me it's probably not going to be all that useful if we don't look at it within the whole complex of social cultural um, dynamics of domination conflict fear violence which really is part of oppression cycling and how those systems keep going we have to understand uh, fear within that frame they're so intimately connected right domination conflict so close to fear fear so close to violence etc Again, I won't go into that here. Um, let's see, next discovery I'd say was the A, anus, denus. These are not in particular order historically, I'm just realizing more or less. Um, DCFB theory came a lot later than the anus, denus theory. And that was an aesthetic. Again, I have this in other videos, the anus denus work. So if you look at any other recent videos, I think I've talked about it a few times. And it's also in my writing. You can look it up on the internet. It's really an aesthetics of fear um, theory. And uh, I think quite very clever. Um, and that actually goes back to 1984 when I designed that model and uh, started asking questions and doing uh, 94 research. Uh, on that as well. So won't go into that, but again, gives you a list of things that you could look up if you want to understand my work better. 
Uh, and then I think um, there might be a few more big discoveries, but I'm going to now get to, I can't remember them all in the moment, doesn't matter, meta motivation uh, theory. And uh, this is what I wanna focus on. So get out the old drawing pen here because I need to make a model to show you what meta motivation theory means. First of all, um, meta, this term here, uh, is important when we're talking about any kind of theory, meta theories. And uh, meta means basically sort of an overview or a, a very high viewpoint that can look down at all the diversity of all the other viewpoints and theories, right? So you can have many different theories, X, Y, Z, and they're all in that landscape of multiple or perspectives and theories. And a meta-motivational theory perspective kind of tries to come and create this kind of umbrella view that can kind of look at all of those under you know, some kind of meta viewpoint or meta theory and so it's a theory of theories i might as well just write that down for your memory a theory of theories and sometimes called a, a theory of everything and the uh, integral theory which uh, i use and i'll just make a, a note that this, this notion of theory of everything, very controversial by the way, so I'm not going to go into controversies about it, but my theory is a meta-motivation theory um, that involves fear uh, that I'm gonna go into great detail here in a moment. It is a theory of everything, and um, really it's not saying that it knows everything. A theory is a view. It, it's just a view, it's a perspective, and it puts things within a certain meaning frame, right? So we can, have meaning within that, but of course, any theory can be challenged. Meta, meta theories can be challenged, and uh, we can correct them and maybe make them better or not. But I like it because it creates a kind of universal ground or a common ground, uh, this theory of everything. And it's no secret and ought not to be a secret that um, Ken Wilber's theory of everything, also called integral theory, uh, has been a major part of my background going way back to the early 1980s when I started reading his work and it wasn't called integral theory then but it was just like I loved the big picture so uh, the other term for this is big picture view or world view and I'm one of those kinds of thinkers and that's how fear gets located so let's clear this and get on to, it's really a uh, meta motivation theory. It's got four components. This arise, I can't remember the exact date in the moment, but I think in the last five, six years, so five years or so um, that I came up with this theory. Um, again, I've written about it. You can look up, you might find more on the internet in detail. So it's not what I'm trying to do here in this uh, short video. I want to more give a, a sense of what it looks like and some of how it can be used. I'll actually give an example of applying my theory, my meta motivation theory. All right, so I start with a, a trajectory like this, um, which represents a line from early development, right? So this would be early or primal early development to more complex, complex maturation. And sort of always a question mark about, well, you know, how, how far can evolution go? How far can development go? And so just to be clear, this is a develop, mental, you know, model uh, theory. 
as part of how systems um, evolve uh, within individuals and in with collective groups and one could even say within consciousness and overall uh, humanity etc um, how it develops so the key term to my theory here let's just see if I can shorten it is fearlessness I'd like to be able to turn that but I don't know if I can it doesn't look like it I'd like to have that lettering of fearlessness flow along in this direction so if you can imagine turning that word fearlessness this represents an increasing fearlessness attained right attained through development under certain conditions again of individual organisms to groups to the entire whole of life and consciousness itself that's why it's a big picture meta motivation theory my argument is that all theories of motivation if we were to look and focus on fear which is my special topic within motivation theories um, that often don't talk about fear directly um, we could actually fit those theories probably to fit this model that's kind of what i'm saying um, you could probably uh, i haven't done that work but one that's the idea of a theory is that i could go in and analyze other theories and make sense of them through my theory so let's just stick with human motivation for the most part although again it can apply to many other organisms i believe this general theory i'm crafting out here so that's the main line here this trajectory of development so the first line which is quite a large proportion this proportion on this motivational scale if you will again this is diagrammatic it's rough right it's generalization so let's kind of be loose with it all and creative and open-minded i say the first level right so it's going to have four components or four levels is fear also called an ecology of fear in my mind and so the developmental task of this early stage of life is ultimately primarily i said ultimately and primarily it's that could be confusing um there it's primarily um, one of negotiating the task of the organism system is negotiating fear and what i would call an ecology of fear because that world is basically full of being prey and being predators everything eats everything else is the sort of short of it all and that cannot be denied or ignored in all living ecological systems so it has been unfortunately fears only recently being recognized and i'm so glad to see in the last couple maybe two decades starting to recognize and they're actually using the term ecology of fear biologists and uh, animal behaviorists people who are out studying creatures in the wild and not just the wild that they they know that fear is really important part in determining how an organism develops and my argument kind of if you kind of put it down to a really simple language again i can't go into the fine details of this theory in this short video is that survival physically is really essential it's primary right so that's the whole notion of why i put this at the first um in the first part of the sorry get my drawing tool this first section right it's it's so primary to survival if you don't survive you don't do anything else like and so yes it's issues around food and cover and shelter and all those kinds of primary um some people call them needs primary components of development 
And the better you do this level, right? So the better an organism or a system looks after, in a sense, manages this level, and that means manages fear well at this level. And again, this is simpler fear. It's a simpler fear complex. It's a simpler ecology, but it is very primal and powerful. So I often say this is the foundational part of evolution itself. And that's a word that comes from Ken Wilber's work. Um, the foundational parts of evolution have to be taken in to great care because they support, right? So this this whole bottom supports the the moving upward, which becomes more and more fragile as I'll now move into the next two layers of my model. So remembering that this is still all part of fearlessness evolving. And I sometimes use the word spirit of fearlessness that is in evolution. It's arguably instinctual, genetic, historical, umpteen billion years old in our history of species. And that is, is that species do not want to stay in excess fear. Um, no system living system wants to stay in excess fear for very long because it's unhealthy and it will start to degrade and create chronic problems. Uh, unhealth and survival skills will start to drop. Everything will drop. Uh, you'll have many health and maintenance issues if you're in chronic fear. However, at the same time, an ecology of fear is essential to be able to acknowledge and manage. So in fact, we humans, we better acknowledge that that is the base primary foundational part of human development. So let's develop good curriculum, teaching socialization processes that really are gonna make that effective, right? Make it a, a really healthy outcome, gives us a good foundation, gives the child a good foundation. That's the basic developmental logic, right? And then once you have a good foundation, we know that evolution keeps going to higher, more complex levels of development. So that's part of the developmental logic of this model, of this theory of development. Next identifying feature is love. An ecology, an ecology of sex really you could put there, uh, of sexuality is probably a better term. And now that I've mentioned that, uh, sexuality reminded me that a term I used recently, and well, probably since 2000, um, that I think is useful to understanding this lower foundational level is uh, eruality as concept, right? Equivalent in, or at least analogous to um, sexuality and its importance we ought to have a curriculum and socialization process that puts spirituality as uh, even more foundationally important, okay? So we're now at love, the second tier of this system of meta-motivation. So a lot of human living behavior is motivated by what we could call love. It's, it's motivated by this ecology of sexuality um, and how that's negotiated because that's going to be our reproduction. So especially in sexual, um, sexual reproduction organisms. So again, focusing on humans here in this talk. So it's pretty important. Um, you can see it, it's quite foundational too, but not as foundational as all of your fear. And then the third one, you're all waiting with great bated breath, I'm sure. What's Dr. Fisher going to put down for that third level of motivation that supposedly is going to explain all human behavior across the continent through time and history? Yes, theoretically, meta-theoretically, uh, that's what I'm actually trying to do is come up with a model or theory that will actually uh, explain uh, all. So last one is freedom. And this is an ecology of 
I guess you could put autonomy. Um, I'm not quite sure what the ecology of is, but it's an ecology of freedom. Uh, ultimately, that that's the next motivator, or you could call the highest motivator, right? It, because now we're at the what Ken Wilber would call the level of significance in systems, or in capitals. So that evolution, as it moves along this trajectory, right, this sort of advancing simple to complex is really a movement equally from foundational aspects of life and systems to the most significant uh, systems, which are you know, very complicated, um, move into much more interest in the individual and the internal parts of our mind and much more complex than just reproduction, uh, certainly much more complex than survival. However, notice in the model, none of these ultimately, whether it's that one, this one, or this one, is better or not better. Okay, so we're not trying to make those kind of judgments. I'm just saying some are more foundational, some are more significant. And we need to put that into our developmental models and theories when we're creating curriculum and creating policies about states, social systems, societies, cultures, how how is it best that we're gonna live in a healthy way, right? So yeah, I have a real agenda here in it's a very simple agenda about how can we develop a really healthy system that uh, moves from fear to fearlessness, right? And uh, we better understand these three ecologies and ultimately they are an ecology of fearlessness. That's the, the trajectory of that line and spirit that's arguably underneath and motivating all of those to keep performing. So now let's end this video um, with uh, applying an example. So I found a paper on education and girlhood written by Krishna Kumar. Um, I don't have the date on this exactly right now. It's fairly recent. It was a study in India uh, in the 2000s and her reflections as a womanist, uh, perhaps a feminist, on the problem in, of girlhood in India and why um, girls are not, and India itself, are not advancing as quickly as one could, would think and ought to be, according to many people. Um, they see India still, in many ways, not moving well ahead into the modernist world and many of the benefits and good parts of modernism. Not that all of modernism is good by any means. So she called a, a section in her paper, I really like this, called Levels of Fear. So she's talking about girlhood, how girls develop, how they're recognized in uh, Indian society and uh, the history of that. And she says girls have three major problems to overcome, which she labels as, so this is gonna be down here, the India example of application of my meta theory. She says that the girls, girlhood, which is the construction of being a girl, is determined now, um, not the ideal by any means, she says, but it tends to be formed through an archaeology of fear. And she says it has three levels of fear. So see the hierarchy um, kind of idea, although that she's not crafting exactly a hierarchy quite so clearly uh, as she says it, but I looked at her three fears, um, which she listed, and I went, wow, those really sort of fit the, um, the three theories. So let's just see if I can point those out. So she says the first one is that the girls have to overcome is this layer of fear, which she just calls physical. And uh, I'll just cite her in this article. She says, at the surface level, and I'm gonna just say, what she means by surface, she means at the foundational level. It's the most physical, right? Because it's the most physical, easy to see uh, of all three of these 
it's the most obvious. Um, one could say, well, a lot of sexuality is obvious, but a lot of sexuality is not obvious. And it's very internal and very subtle. And uh, a lot of survival is almost all pretty physical for the most part. So she's just talking about surface um, fear. And she says, fear refers to the body in terms of injuries that might deface the body of the girl in Indian society. And then she goes in to say is that parental gaze is intense upon girls, much different than a boy's where the girls have to be protected to not scratch, injure, not play too rough, not uh, risk too much. And so they're in this constant protect protective gaze um, that comes through the parental, that comes through the cultural myths and the folk ways of, you know, girls, these young women are, young girls are going to be married very early and they have to be basically perfect virgins, et cetera, et cetera. So, under constant surveillance to maintain this perfect physicality. And so she says girls end up with this very deep uh, internalized um, fear of their own bodies and fear of risk. And, you know, that's not a good thing. Um, so let's go to the second fear that this Kumar uh, comes up with for girls girlhood is uh, sexual fear and that's because of uh, excess gaze um, rape um, the sort of cultural formations that give male privilege to access female bodies and that can be as early and young as whatever and that uh, she says there are myths within Indian society a uh, whole mythology of fears around girls that girls are helpless to the male sexual desires and thrust and that they really need to more or less yield to that male uh, patriarchal system of women's bodies being commodity and being therefore male use and abuse. Uh, the third fear Oh, you might see, right. I should just draw that out. So a nice connection, right? This is coming from Kumar's study. There we go. Next one, she calls sexual fear. Uh-huh, that is a problem within the second motivational level on my theory uh, of the love or the ecology of sexuality. And then her third one, you guessed it, is... Uh, Fear of freedom. It's the third archaeology layer, uh, archaeology of fear layer that Kumar identifies. And indeed, I thought that was pretty interesting to see. Freedom. Yeah, right there. The ecology of autonomy and how free a girl uh, can, can or cannot you know, exist within the Indian society. Uh, this is even contemporary, of course, goes back into ancient times. So that was a pretty nice uh, study for me to, I should just put down the author here so you can, her name is, you can look this up, Krishna Kumar, and it's just called Education and Girlhood. discussion paper available on the internet so I uh, won't say too much more I think that covers everything I wanted to share in this video uh, thanks for tuning in um, again um, theoretical why is that so important um, it, it can actually help make sense of real practical applications like this issue of India and I think if uh, you or anyone starts uh, utilizing this meta-motivational meta theory I have, um, moving along this fearlessness trajectory, fear, ecology of fear, ecology of love, and ecology of freedom, I think we'd really have a nice holistic integral model um, to develop societies. And for nations that are in development and still developing and struggling, 
and also correction for those who are well developed and are creating a lot of toxicity and pathology and threat to the planet. I think that little four component meta motivation theory will be really uh, useful. So uh, let's keep uh, exa examining it and improving it and give me feedback on it anytime. Uh, I look forward to that uh, and hopefully I'll write a lot more about it as well, right? So all the best to you and uh, welcome to the world of virology. <laughs>